Welcome to the overview module in the history of surgery curriculum. My name is Dale Smith, and I have no conflicts of interest to declare. You are preparing to become a surgical intern, the next step in realizing your dream of becoming a surgeon. In the 21st century, a surgeon is a highly respected, specialized member of the medical profession, and joining that elite requires extensive education. In your early years of postgraduate training, much of that learning will focus on the care of the patient, and particularly the patient's wound. In a very real sense, the only definition of the surgeon that transcends both time and place is one who manages wounds. The oldest records of medicine come from ancient Egypt 4,000 years ago and include the Edwin Smith Papyrus, a wound treatment manual. Most of our Western tradition traces our healing back to the ancient Greeks and a community called Hippocratics, named after their founder, Hippocrates. Despite formal prohibition, the original Hippocratic Oath forbids the practice of surgery, most Hippocratics probably practiced some surgery. The ideas and practice spread throughout the ancient world, sometimes with considerable variation. They left a substantial and diverse collection of text. Some of their texts deal with surgery, particularly the management of what we would call orthopedic injury, and describe various procedures and appliances to assist in the restoration of function. While Islamic authors crucially preserved many of the ancient Greek texts, we have almost no records of surgery in Western Europe from the 3rd to the 12th century. But surgery, the management of wounds, did not stop. The practice was taught from master to apprentice across the generations. By the 12th century, European scholars had recovered enough ancient literature from the Arabic translation to inspire study, including the study of medicine and medieval universities were founded as places of scholarship. The influence of the Hippocratic Oath convinced most university-trained physicians to abstain from surgical therapy. There were important exceptions. The medieval surgical community continued to be primarily apprentice-trained and separate from the emerging MD-based physician community. A profession is a community of practitioners who share standards, and enjoy public support for their activities. The medical profession had the university-based MD as their shared standard, but surgical communities were much more local, international communication was difficult, and each community had different expectations. Despite variable craft skills, between the 15th and the 18th century, a surgical profession emerged in Europe based upon the new study of human anatomy. The anatomical tradition was made practical by improved communication resulting from the invention and spread of printing. Working from newly available Greek texts, Andreas Vesalius realized all the ancient anatomical descriptions were based on animal dissection. His great atlas of 1543 on the structure of the human body started a new research and education tradition of anatomical study by personal human dissection. Simultaneously, national surgical communities attracted important patronage from the rulers of the emerging European nation-state because of their potential military value. Since surgeons were not socially elite, they were plentiful enough to accompany soldiers and sailors on campaign. And so they began to expand their practice from trauma to include some disease management. Royal patronage allowed standards to be taught and enforced. Surgical education was quite eclectic. Some surgeons began to take the MD degree, especially in Italy and Scotland, and some used non-university anatomical and hospital-based schools to augment apprenticeship training. Professionalism also depends on the larger societies accepting the profession's definition of practice and standards. That surgeons were becoming a responsible professional community is suggested by an epigraph for a now unknown French surgeon of the 15th century. To cure sometimes, to relieve often, and to comfort or care always. 
it's still not a bad code of professional conduct. So, what did these modern surgeons do? What was their surgical armamentarium? They did what people needed them to do, usually dictated by danger and pain. The increased anatomical knowledge allows us to recognize more of the operations than we did in medieval accounts. Probably the most dramatic development of 18th century surgery was the management of peripheral aneurysm. Aneurysms could only be managed by amputation. But several European surgeons were trying to ligate vessels for the isolation of the aneurysm when John Hunter undertook the operation on a popliteal aneurysm case in 1785. Hunter, a Scottish surgeon who taught anatomy and physiology with his brother in London, used proximal ligation at sufficient distance from the aneurysm to be in healthy tissue. He advocated that surgeons must learn not just anatomy, but physiology and pathophysiology to be effective. And Hunterian surgery became a synonym for scientifically inspired practice in the 19th century. This more science-inspired surgical approach led to heroic arterial ligations for aneurysm, expansions of ophthalmic surgery, conservative orthopedic management which preserved limbs following type 2 and type 3 fractures, a rise in gynecologic surgery, and some efforts at cesarean section. But all these successes were rare and had alarmingly high case fatality rates. Hunter and others advanced the practice of surgery, but the excruciating pain it caused patients understandably limited its application. A variety of people experimented with anesthetic effects of nitrous oxide and ether, but the definitive illustration was by John Collins Warren. Dr. Warren had allowed other proponents of anesthetics in his operating room, and despite failure, remained open to finding new ways to reduce the pain of surgery. On the 16th of October, 1846, he allowed William Morton to etherize a patient on his Massachusetts General Hospital service. His now classic, This is no humbug, signaled the success. Chloroform was introduced the following year in Scotland by James Simpson. While there was some skepticism about the new drugs, since their mode of action was not understood, the empirical reality of pain relief, demonstrated in hospital tents in the Crimea and the American Civil War, convinced most practitioners of the virtues of anesthesia. For a variety of reasons, the medical profession was increasingly dissatisfied with traditional explanations of disease causation. And while Americans were engaged in the Civil War, a French chemist, Louis Pasteur, was studying fermentation and spontaneous generation. He developed sterilization techniques that gave rise to pasteurization methods and postulated that diseases were the result of microscopic life forms similar to those which caused fermentation. The Glasgow surgeon, Joseph Lister, applied Pasteur's germ theory to wound healing and developed the first antiseptic, that is, germ-killing bandages, and then antiseptic technique in which the germs on the patient and the instruments were killed primarily using carbolic acid. He obtained results superior to those of his contemporaries, but it took several decades for the profession of surgery to accept his conclusions. By the 1870s, Robert Koch refined the amorphous germ theory into a very specific medical microbiology, one germ causes one disease. And he was one of several researchers who proved heat was more effective than chemical sterilization. Surgical scientists using the bacteriological researches developed and introduced the concept of aseptic surgery, preventing germs from being introduced into the operating environment. By the 1890s, it evolved into a style of surgical cleanliness recognizable today. While these great scientific innovations were taking place in the 19th century, the surgical community was changing as well. Surgeons became part of the MD-based medical profession. They became physicians first. It happened at different rates in different countries, starting in post-revolutionary France and finally coming to Great Britain in 1886. In the United States, the traditional distinctions had never taken firm hold, 
both because they were weakening in Europe at the time of the country's founding and because of weak universities and poor medical schools. As surgeons became physicians, the question of where and how to obtain operative skill became increasingly important. Anesthesia both reduced patient fears and allowed longer and surer dissection by the surgeon, while antiseptics and aseptic techniques reduced postoperative infection. The result was more and safer surgical intervention on the part of skilled surgeons. The best of the new surgery was very good. New approaches to old surgical problems were common, and in arterial repair, cancer removal, ophthalmology and gynecology, the results were dramatic. Even more impressive component of the new surgery was the management of new disease entities recognized by the new science. Beginning with pathologist Reginald Heber Fitz and appendicitis, the problems of the acute abdomen were defined post-mortem, and the suggestion made that surgeons intervening promptly might limit the deadly peritonitis of abdominal diseases. Surgeons quickly defined the various conditions of the acute abdomen as requiring definitive surgical exploration. The new physiology of the endocrine system identified glands that overproduced hormones causing adverse reactions in the body. Surgeons, led by Theodore Coker of Switzerland, advocated removal of all or part of the offending glands. By the first decade of the 20th century, surgery had virtually redefined cure as the dramatic interruption of the natural history of the disease process, while drug therapy still had little to offer beyond palliation. Of course, not all practitioners were equally skilled or up-to-date, and patients had no way to evaluate practitioner knowledge and skill. The American College of Surgeons, founded in 1913, proposed its fellowship distinction as a promise of surgical experience and ethical behavior. The college also worked steadily to improve surgical practice. Committees, like the Committee on Fractures, worked to determine and publish best practice. And the hospital accreditation program went a long way towards ensuring quality surgical and post-operative care. The college's annual clinical congress and other meetings was a constant source of stimulating new ideas and reports of the activities of surgical subspecialists. The new positive pressure anesthesia allowed safe thoracic intervention. Harvey Cushing and a few other pioneers were shaping a new specialty of neurologic surgery. Surgical pathology and the activities of the college were bringing increasing attention to the problems of cancer and the hope of early diagnosis. But the question of how to move these and other innovations from the academic medical center and large urban hospital to reach everyone in the nation was socially and intellectually complex. Clear answers were not forthcoming as the Great Depression further challenged Americans' access to skilled surgical care. Part of the answer was better training and credentialing, and the various surgical organizations were vigorous proponents of the emerging system of residency education and specialty board certification in the 1930s. In the years after the Second World War, the introduction and use of antibiotics and the wider use of blood products expanded surgical possibilities further. Technology allowed better imaging and more surgical opportunities. Entire new fields like cardiovascular and transplant surgery emerged, enabled by equipment like heart-lung machines and scientific advances in immunology. The physiology of shock was better understood, and trauma studies accelerated, while genetics helped unlock some of the secrets of cancer. Research and development when combined with improved and quality-controlled education and training, had made surgeons the most respected of practitioners. But the cost of the technology and care made access to surgical therapy extremely variable. By the 1970s, the American College of Surgeons and the Venerable American Surgical Association combined to study the distribution of surgical services in the United States and began to look for ways to make improved care more widely available. Despite such efforts, access and comparative effectiveness questions remain important social and professional issues for the 21st century practitioner. The heritage of surgery suggests that 
a lifelong commitment to science and quality care, exemplified by Hippocrates and Hunter, and a commitment to patience captured in the experience of that unknown French surgeon who comforted or cared always, will provide you with a clear way forward. We encourage you to explore the other modules of this curriculum as you begin to learn the history of your future.